worship, our pre-worship, I guess we call it practice, but we're actually going to refer to it as pre-worship because pre-worship ran over a little bit this morning, and so we're all fired up and ready to worship, continue worshiping. Um, our call to worship this morning, John 8, 32. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. That simple. <laughs> Amen. I will invite everybody who cares to stand to stand and join us in worship, in song. <laughs> Oh, 
Praises, amen. All right. I'm going to keep it up tempo a little bit. It's one called Open Up the Heavens. I'm 
Good morning. Welcome to Surfside Church. I'd like to invite the boys and girls to come on up here for a minute. Well, I. You didn't have any coffee this morning, did you? Aha, there's a lot of energy this morning. Coffee. Coffee, coffee. All right, I got something to show you. I eat coffee. I have something to show you. Water. Water. Water, water in a cup. It's a glass cup with water in it. It's a glass cup with water in it. What else do you observe about this? It is measuring. It was a peanut butter jar before. Uh, no, I didn't bring the peanut butter jar. <laughs> this one is, though, a canning jar. Yes, you're right. Can you drink out of these? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, okay. What else do you observe about this? Uh, it also yeah. has... I'll go ahead for your first menu. Yes. Is it a part of the future? <laughs> 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 Hold on to that for a minute. Okay, this... It can also measure the water. God, I'm glad you measured the water. Now, if you measure the water, what is the measurement of the water in this glass? It says, like, where It's way up there. Is this glass full, or is it half full, or is it half empty? What it's do you think? half full. Half full? Yeah, good, good. Half full, half this, right? Yeah. How, do you know, um, can you tell me how long this water has been around? Millions of what? Years. Years. Do you know how long the water was sitting on the table? No. An hour. An hour. An hour? Do you know how long this glass has existed? This jar? No. Hmm. I probably say around 30 to 50 years. 30 to 50 years, do you agree? And how about you? Do you think 30 to 50 years? Or is it more or less? More or less, 30 or 50 years, more or less, yeah. 
You think it's more? I mean, it could be more. It might actually be. I don't know if there's a date anywhere on it. Did you know? Let me see. You see a date? There's no date. There is no date. It looks like it's not on the So board. how do we really know, right? Oh, I see the date. Right there, right there. It's around for USA. Uh, did you? It says USA. USA? Oh, it was made in the USA. So it is stamped with something. We know a little bit of something that we observed from this. Yes. Uh huh. All right. So did you know something? That sometimes, well, there's people who get into arguments about stuff. About. Well, like, is it half full or is it half empty? They get into arguments about how long the water existed. They get into arguments about the. Should there even should we even drink out of something like this, or should it be coming out of a? I mean, is this a water glass, or not? And what makes it a water glass? The fact that water's in it or not in it? All those kinds of things. You get into all that kind of stuff. But you guys, I'm very happy because it's pretty simple for you all. You say, look, there's water in there. You can drink water out of it. Yes, thank you. I want a drink. Ah, uh, yeah. And all that kind of stuff. I hope that the next time that you see a cup of water like this, I hope you remember a couple of things. One, there's people all around us that are very, very thirsty. And did you know what? Sometimes whenever people get into arguing about all this stuff, they forget to look at the people that are really, really thirsty. Yeah. They spend so much time fighting about this. And I hope that you remember that Jesus is the living water that helps your soul and your heart. Yeah, I see it. That's why I said, hold on to it. You knew Jesus was connected to it somehow. <laughs> all right. So when you, see some, when you see another glass of water, remember, and like you have already have, and you've already taught many people here, that it's better to just realize there's water in there and this is something to drink out of and it's a way to help you if you're thirsty. And remember to share that with your friends, that Jesus is a way to help them too, okay? All right, let's bow our heads together and let's pray. Jesus, thank you for your love. Jesus, thank you that you're always with us. Help us today and every day, we pray. Keep us safe, amen. All right, and you guys can head off to Kids Church. I'm so thankful for everybody that works in the children's department. I have these two over here, like, like they're like, yay, we're not in today, are we? No. You jacked him up on purpose, didn't you? It was, it's revenge for last week, right? <laughs> All right, just to touch on a couple of announcements here as we prepare to worship by our giving. Um, Thursday, uh, me and the family, we're headed up to Stanford, Florida. It's actually the state meeting for Florida Church of God, so we're headed up there. Um, we're going to actually be camping in a state park that's still open after all the flooding. At least they say they're still open. If not, we're just going to camp in the parking lot of the church, and we'll just let them know. <laughs> but anyway, it's a state meeting up there. Then from there, we're traveling uh, further north to catch some fall leaves, and then we'll be back. But we have a special guest who will be speaking with us next week, and she's going to be sharing her story of her walk with Jesus. And it's Miss Sharon over here. Uh, she agreed this morning to do that. So you'll don't, you will not want to miss that next week, and then we'll be back again after that. Our last Sunday is... Uh, of the month is our fifth Sunday service project. So we'll meet here. The plan is that we'll meet here in the parking lot like we usually do at 10 o'clock in the morning and then we'll go out to the service project from there. And uh, we need to kind of settle in on exactly on what we're going to be doing with that. And so we'll do that uh, this week and let everybody know what we've got going on. So rather than a worship service here on the last Sunday, we meet here and then we go to go work on our service project that we do. All right. And otherwise, you'll see the other announcements there printed in the bulletin for us today. All right, so let us worship now by the giving of our offering.
Almighty God, we thank you that we can enter into your courts. We thank you that Jesus himself opens the door and bids us to come inside. To come into the outer courts of where we can begin to gather together and worship with others that call upon your name. And then Jesus walks through the midst of the crowd and goes into the entrance to the Holy of Holies and pulls away the veil and slides it back and says, come into the very, very heart of God. And so we come in, in awe and wonder and respect to just the magnitude of your glory and the warmth of your love. It's in this space that we come with all of our weariness and all of our fatigue and all of the, the, the dust that's upon our souls and our faces as we wait for the breakthrough that we've been looking for, that we're waiting for, that we're calling for, that we've been praying for. 
It's into this holy of holy space that we come singing praises for miracles revealed and provision provided and direction given and doors that have been opened. And as we come in prayer, as we come in waiting, as we come in expectancy, as we come in receiving, as we come in joyfulness and thankfulness together as one church, as one body, we hold hands with one another saying, holy, holy, holy are you, Lord Almighty. And as your spirit moves among us, may it resonate in the praises and in the prayers. As the Holy Spirit moves among us, may your your spirit actually interpret all of it as an offering to you. The requests and the waiting and the provision and the praise. And as we're gathered in this moment of worship offering this, may, may our eyes not be so transfixed upon you that we don't look to one another and say there is hope. And to look to one another and say, there is strength. Look to one another and say, there is salvation. And who does that come from? It comes from the Lord Almighty. Lord, we thank you that we can can lift up those around us in prayer. And there are those that do. They need hope right now. They're searching for salvation and they're trying everything but your son and they need Jesus right now. They need just enough to make it for another hour to make it through this day one step at a time. Father, they are looking at multiple paths in front of them and they're wondering which one to take. Or they feel like they're at a dead end and they see no path or way forward. Health issues of their loved ones are weighing heavily upon their heart. The loss of loved ones are weighing even heavier. And so, Father, as we are joined with our hands and our hearts with those that are walking all these different places, we lift them before you. We give them into your lap. We invite them into your hope and your presence, knowing, God, that as your spirit moves and sustains us, your spirit moves and sustains them. Move the mountains, we ask. Provide the light, we ask. Convince of the truth, we ask. Silence the lies, we ask. Holy God, we thank you that you're moving in our midst and you're moving in the midst of our family, in our coworkers, our friends, and our community. In this moment as we're together here for this, these couple more minutes, or may we hear you, may we understand you, and may we be strengthened by you yet again to go and carry your light and be your ambassadors in all these places where you have placed us intentionally to represent your son, Jesus. We thank you. We love you. We rest in your arms in worship. Let it be. Let it be. Amen. I need to come and get my notes. Uh, Today we continue on in our series on truth. This is actually our last installment as far as an actual series on truth. And this one is about uh, what to do when Christian beliefs collide. And it's actually a question that came out of our last question and answer Sunday. It was one that was written down and kind of passed to me after it was over. And I said, well, you know, this would go very well in what we're doing here and and how we're going. So here's how the question was was framed and presented. It says, uh, when you are in a discussion with a person who is part of a different Christian denomination, how do you handle topics about doctrinal differences or when their beliefs might be hindering them from loving their neighbor? And then give some examples. So let me just kind of walk through some examples on this. I think this might be something that we have all experienced one way or another. So uh, some examples are like predestination. 
Right? So God knows ahead of time who all is going to be saved and so on and that kind of thing. What, what, how do you handle differences about that belief of whether predestination is something that happens or not? Or the idea of something like young earth. There the earth is only a couple thousand years old rather than the millions of billions of years that everyone else wants to say that it is and so on, and those two things conflict. Or what about Revelation, where, well, are, are, is the rapture pre-tribulation or post-tribulation? Is there a thousand-year reign or is there not a thousand-year reign? Or what about the return of Christ? Uh, there's some people that say that, well, when the last person who's predestined to be saved is saved, and then Christ comes back. There's others that say, well, it... There's after, it has to come after the signs of revelation. And then there's others that are like, well, it's going to be like the times of Noah. People will be giving in marriage and so on, and no one will even be looking for it, and no one really knows when it's going to happen. Or what about in the area of church rules? Like, well, only men pray publicly when women are present. I just wish more people would pray publicly. It would be an amazing thing, right? But what, what, only men can pray when women are around, or only men can preach and lead the church. Or, well, how about dress? You know, skirts have to be a certain length. Men aren't supposed to wear them or wear them. I mean, what's the skirt length for men, you know? Uh, that kind of thing. But, like, what about skirt, like skirt length or hair length and hairstyle or neckties? Did you know that there's actually, in the Church of God movement, there was a time when neckties were considered something you weren't supposed to wear to church. They were sinful. When, how does that contrast with, well, you're supposed to wear a necktie to church and do all that kind of stuff. So what about this? You know, those kinds of things. What about music or no music? Are you supposed to use instruments in worship or not use instruments in worship? What about uh, the official word of God? What translation is it? Is it the, new, the King James or the New King James or Greek, Hebrew, Aramaic? What is it going to be? What about other things like this, like baptism? Do we baptize infants or not? And then how do you baptize? Do you take water and sprinkle it on them? Do you pour it on them or do you dunk them? I mean, immersion, you put them down underneath the water. How do you do it? And people can have strong feelings and, and opinions about these things. As I'm even going through the list, you're already having them snap off in your head on the way that they're supposed to be done. It's because how you've been brought up or what's been brought up in the church. And you go, well, how you've been taught. And it's like, it's supposed to be this way, this way, or this way. This is what I've been taught. And it's even as I go through that whole list, I'm, doing very, I'm trying very hard not to get into the weeds about it, about, well, here's the reason why this, this, and this. So what are we supposed to do? Because the question is about these examples, so I don't want to get into all the examples because we could spend a lot of time and make a whole other message series on that about this, that, or the other. But people have strong feelings and opinions about them, so what do we do? And just to make it even uh, more of an interesting situation, that there's usually for most, just about all the sides on any particular issue, they usually bring out scripture, proof text. There's you know, this little verse about this or this little verse about that in order to back it up. Or uh, on s someone has a reasoning for something, and then they come up with different proof texts to support the position. And sometimes that even goes from, all right, here's our position, and then now we need to find scriptures in order to back up that position. And, well, the King James says it this way on this part, so let's put that. And then the common English version phrases another verse this way, which we can add on to that. And then we can take the New King James, or we can take the Revised Standard and add it to make another position here. And they just kind of do all different kinds of things with it. And then after that, we also realize that different churches are started and different denominations are started and different movements are started based upon all of this. It's sort of like, you know, we have the church of the half full, we have the church of the half empty, we have the church of thou shalt not drink out of mason jars, thou only drink out of glasses. Well, not out of glasses, Jesus actually drunk out of probably clay uh, bowls, so let's drink out of clay bowls. And then we have all these different things and we argue about all this different stuff. And we form churches based around it. We move down the street out of one and go to another. And then when we're in that, and then if we visit that church and it's not exactly what we think that it ought to be about something like this, then we say, well, let me go try another church until they actually drink out of the thing that I think they're supposed to be drinking out of and drinking what I think they're supposed to be drinking. In this church, you'll never drink the Kool-Aid. That's to keep it light and throw it in there. All right. Now, the problem, is, it's tough because like everybody's already, you're already there, aren't you? I'm sitting here going around bringing all these things up, and everybody's like, I'm in my camp, I'm in my camp, and here we go. It's a shame I couldn't have the bumper, bumper music playing ahead of time because it was an arena sports theme. You know, like when you go there and you hear all this, like, dun, 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 and all that kind of stuff. It's like, because here we go. We're going into this, right? What do we do? 
And see, the problem with this is when we get into this, it's one thing to sit around in academia and talk about it. It's one thing for us to sit around in a small group and say, well, what about this and what about this and what about that? But what happens with this is that the problem is that people and churches are the people start arguing about these things. And we argue about it publicly as well as privately or one on one to one with someone. And we become more passionate about these issues than what we are about sharing Jesus. And so we get passionate about, you know, what kind of cup is supposed to be or how we're supposed to baptize or all these different kinds of things. Is Jesus coming back pre-tribulation, you know, pre post-tribulation, all that kind of stuff, all these different things. We get into these arguments and we get really detailed and we write books about them and we get big, long theses about them. and We sit down and have these arguments about them and we get more passionate about it than what we do about, than about sharing Jesus with other people. And these people that are around us, there's people that are looking for hope. They're looking for Jesus, and they're get, as, they're, as they're walking through this, they're, they're watching this church argue and this church argue, and they argue with each other publicly, and they're getting caught in the crossfire when actually we need to be bringing them to the cross. And so they, the people who are, who are running this through their mind, and they're saying, well, what is truth? What is this? How do I, where is hope? And they watch and say, do I want to be part of a group of people that can't get, they're arguing over something like baptism or over arguing over when Jesus comes back or they're arguing over these other things and I'm just looking for someone, I'm looking for a way to make it tomorrow, make it today. Their soul is starving and we're arguing about what? So that becomes the problem. The pe people are looking for hope, they're looking for Jesus. And the other part of this problem is, is that the enemy uses this, the enemy leverages this also. The enemy uses this to keep churches internally focused and battling and distracted rather than reaching out. Instead of churches combining efforts together, the people of God combining efforts together and showing unity in what they're doing and presenting Jesus, it actually is like, look at this difference between this one and look at this difference between this one. And then the enemy actually brings all that up to the top so everybody sees that rather than combined worship or rather than a combined presentation of Jesus Christ. The enemy uses it to and to leverage it to embarrass the cause of Christ. The enemy uses it to erode trust in those who are searching for life in Jesus. I don't know if I, people say, I don't know if I can trust a church. I don't know if I can because they get so caught up in these other things. Am I going to be dressed right when I go in the door? Are people going to judge me because of what I'm wearing or what I forgot to put on? Are they going to be upset? They're going to do something like communion. How am I supposed to do that? What's the right way to take it? Do I need to go through a 13-week class in order to be able to take communion, or can I just walk up and take it? How do I know? Now, fortunately for us, we're not left without a guide in any of this, right? Because this kind of stuff was happening in Bible times, too, in the, in the books that we have written here in the Bible to help give us some guidance on some things. And it's actually written by the same fellow that sometimes gets proof texted for some of these other positions to say, well, this is why this shouldn't happen or this should happen or that kind of thing. But it's taken, whenever things are lifted out of context and lifted out of culture, we generally have a bit of a problem. So we have to keep things into cult, in context and in culture and read around them in order to know what ha is happening. So we're going to read this in, in context and in culture by what's happening here. We're going to second. Timothy chapter 2, verses 11 through 16. And this is Paul writing to Timothy, who he's mentoring, and he's talking to him about things in the church. And Timothy is a pastor working in one of the churches that Paul has put together. And, he's, and I'm starting here with a quote that he's quoting to Timothy. All right. Here's a trustworthy saying, and he's quoting this. If we died with him, being Jesus, we will also live with him. If we endure, we'll also reign with him. If we disown him, he will also disown us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot disown himself. Keep reminding, he's, he's done quoting and now he's, talk, he's writing in his own, his own thoughts to Timothy. Keep reminding God's people of these things. Warn them before God against quarreling about words. It is of no value and only ruins those who listen. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. Avoid godless chatter because those who indulge in it will become more and more ungodly. And then he has an example in here. It goes into verse 17, just so that you know he, there's a real life example in what he's dealing with, what kind of prompted some of this. 
Their teachings will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus, who have departed from the truth. They say that the resurrection has already taken place, and they destroy the faith of some. So here they were already arguing, but the resurrection has already taken. And other people have happened. And other people are saying, no, it hasn't happened. Back and forth. So he already has something going here. But this one's going, you know, this one's a deeper theological issue than some of the things that we even argue about in our churches. But he goes on and gives us a foundation. Nevertheless, God's solid foundation stands firm, sealed with this inscription. The Lord knows those who are his, and everyone who confesses the name of the Lord must turn away from wickedness. So in all this, there's an example. He writes to Timothy about it. And he, what this, the heart of it is, is this, in that keep reminding God's people of these things, warn them before God against quarreling about words. It's of no value and only ruins those who listen. That's what happens when we get into this. We get into quarreling about something like this, and then we get into quarreling about how someone should be baptized or not baptized. We get quarreling into what we should wear to church or not wear to church. We get quarreling in all these different things. We start arguing about these things. And it just destroys those who listen. Because people on the outside are paying attention. And they're like, if they, how, why do I want to be involved with a group like this? And other people get involved in the groups and then leave because of the quarreling and all this. And that just shares it even more. And so we need to take Paul's teaching to heart. Paul comes to that foundation so what are we to do? 2 Timothy 2.14. Avoid arguing, arguing and then remember the lost person who's being ruined by the argument. Put them ahead of everything and say, who's listening to this? Who's in the middle of all this and is getting caught in the middle of all of this? All right, what do we do with it? And then what else are we to do? So remember the person who's, who's listening on the outside of it. And the next thing you do is listen to the other person's beliefs, because that's really what the question was about. How do we handle this? What do we do with it? And some might say, well, let me, you know, give me some more proof text, Mark. Give me some more texts that are in, in, in uh, context and so on like this so that I can bolster my position in order to be able to come and really overwhelmingly present this proof to the other person to shift them over to my way of thinking. But I'm going to come at it from a whole different perspective. I'm going to come at it from a perspective of listening rather than arguing. Listen. Listen to the other person's beliefs. Listen to the other person's beliefs. You don't, you don't have to integrate them as your own. Just to listen to what someone else's theology is, listen to what someone else's beliefs are, listen to what someone else's doctrine is. They don't, it doesn't mean that you're saying that this is what you believe, but just listen. And it's amazing what would happen if we were to listen to one another, even in our churches, and say, okay, well, why do you believe that infants should be baptized? Why do you believe that infants shouldn't be baptized? Ask questions to help bring it out. You show respect when you listen and when you try to gain an understanding. Why do you believe in predestination? Why do you not believe in predestination? Why do you believe that only men should be praying publicly? Why do you believe that they shouldn't be? Why? You start asking questions, and what that does is it shows respect, it shows listening, and it allows us to learn from one another. It allows us to learn. Now, and it's not a position that someone's expecting you to take. Usually they're expecting, well, I believe this because of this, this, and this. And you say, well, I believe this because this, this, and this. And boom, 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 boom. And we go, go on to social media, and we start posting, and then we start contradicting the other post, and we start arguing, and we have a big, long thing like this going on. And then someone says, I unfriend you, and I unfriend you. And, and everybody else watched. What if we start asking why? Why, why, why? And you know what happens whenever you get asked, when you ask someone why, they have to explain why. And if they go, I don't know, okay, can you find out more about it to let me know why you believe this? And if, what if someone asks you why? Like you actually get into a conversation with someone and you believe your way is the way that it's supposed to be, and, then they, and what if they take that tactic on you? And you say, well, I believe that this and this and this. Well, why, why do you believe that? And then do you know why? And then you can start to share why, but now they're listening on that end. Some of my greatest quests are, that have shaped me, uh, for me, and some of and on my journey is that when people have asked why, rather than just arguing the position, they're like, why do you think this? Why, why are you here? Why, why is this your belief? And then I would go, hmm, let me think about it. 
And was oftentimes, I still I ask, I have to ask myself that question. Why do I believe this? Why, before I come to preach something, it's like, why? Why am I going to present this? Is it just because I've heard someone else say it? Do you know how many folks preach what they heard someone else preach, and they never bother to ask themselves why they're saying what they're saying? Now, for years, here's another example, right? So whenever, did Jesus, did God turn his face away from Jesus when he was on the cross? Whenever Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Did, G, did God turn his face away from him because God can't look upon sin? Or did he still see him there and Jesus was doing something else? How many of you heard preach that God couldn't look at Jesus anymore because Jesus took on all the sins of the world and so God had to turn his face away from him and then Jesus in despair because he'd never had his father turn his back to him again before. Now that's why he cried that out. I've preached that before in my early years and it's because that's what I've heard said, but I never asked why. And I never asked the preacher who was up front, why are you saying what you're saying? I will never be affronted if you ask me why. Just be prepared for an hour-long conversation after you ask me why. But, or I'll go look, but why? And so I was sitting and I actually sat back and had to go, why is, why is that the case? Did that actually happen? And I had to go look and started looking and seeing. And then someone actually taught me that says, you know, this is the opening line of Psalm 22. And I looked at that and I said, oh, absolutely. Look at all of Psalm 22. Psalm 22 lays out everything that Jesus went through on the cross. And then I look at other things through the narrative of Scripture from the Genesis to Revelation, and I go, I don't see anywhere where God's not looking at sinners. It's not like God's suddenly blind and can't see them. He says, you've sinned, repent from your sin. You've sinned, I need to save you. Even though your sins be like scarlet, I'll wash them white as snow. He's seen sin, he sees us. He, we don't disappear from him whenever we have, we've done something wrong. There's hope in that. Our hearts also tell us, if we want to go to that kind of thing, our hearts also tell us about that, because if we do something wrong, we're like, wait, we feel like we're worried about the judgment of God. Well, how can God inflict judgment upon us if he can't see us? So it starts to walk all these things through. And so for other things, baptism, why, why, why? Why this, why that? Why are there certain things? So ask that. It shows respect when you listen and try to gain an understanding. And your question might spark a quest in the person that you're, that you're asking this of. And they might not give it to you right then and there because we have lots of folks who, you know, if you're like me, you've got to dig your heels in and you don't want to sit there and say, well, I don't really know. And so they'll come up with something and they might even get all mad at you and you'll say, well, that response was very disproportional to my question. And they'll walk away from you. But they might sit there. What that'll do is like, wow, let me, they'll, something will stir in that. It's amazing how the Holy Spirit can take a why question and cause a cognitive dissonance and a spiritual dissonance where it's like something's not gelling. And all of a sudden, it's, they start walking through trying to figure out what's going on and to try to feel it out. So your question might spark a quest. And if you're asked about what you believe, well, you, now you have the chance to share about it. Because the person who's asking wants to know. The person who's asking has opened the door for you to be able to give a response. And so you're not preaching at them anymore if you're just answering their question. But when we do that, if we're asked what we believe, I have, there's another scripture that's given to us out of 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 15. And I'm, and I'm going to go read it into 16 because I don't want to just leave you hanging in the middle of his sentence there. But... I'm wondering if I wrote down the wrong thing again. 3.15. Nope, that's not what I want. Somehow from putting it on there, what? I, this is what I want up there, right? Yeah, 1 Peter 3.15. Oh, it's because I'm in 2 Peter. Never mind, sorry. 1 Peter 3.15. <laughs> Nobody asked why. <laughs> why? Yeah, I'm in the wrong book. Why can't you find it? Because I'm looking at the wrong thing there. Okay. 1 Peter 3.15. I'm like, I'm I thought that was right. I'm in 2 Peter there, 3.15. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord, and then always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. And then as it goes into 16, because it's a comma there, not a period, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. Because he's in the context of people mistreating people because of what they believe in Christ and following Christ. So give your answer with gentleness and respect if you're asked. Now, 
What else are we supposed to do with this? Well, how about we shift to focusing on our foundation? In what Paul wrote to Timothy at the end of that, he shifts from arguments about whether the resurrection has happened already or not and all those kinds of things. He shifts to, let's go back to our foundation. Our foundation is Jesus Christ. So let's talk with them and say, let's, let's find something that we have in common. Do we have this in common? Do we have Jesus Christ as Savior in common? Do we have Jesus Christ as the Son of God in common? Does our relationship with Jesus lead us to turn from sinful behavior, as what Paul writes to Timothy at the end of it? Everyone who believes in Jesus Christ must turn from wickedness. Does our belief in our relationship with Jesus lead us to turn from that? And can we reach past the differences of how people should be baptized and not baptized and who should pray and not should pray? Can we reach past those differences to work together to see the lost, to love the lost, to share the hope of Jesus with the lost? Now, part of what was in this question was what about whenever the religious beliefs, the, the, the doctrines and so on, turn into devaluing other people, right? Um, an example could be uh, someone who's uh, headed to an, uh, an abortion clinic and on their way in, there's church people gathered outside and they're screaming at the person on their way in and they're screaming at the person on the way out. And they're telling them that how that's against God and that's this, this kind of thing and all that kind of stuff. Do you think that the screaming at the person on the way in and screaming at the person on the way out is actually going to change for the better the person who's walking, or who's already in a whirlwind and is going through that, going in and through that coming out? Mm -mm. But what if we sat down and asked why? What if we dealt with things with gentleness and respect? What if we sat and said, why? Why are you, why, what got you here? Why are you here? How can we help? What's hurting inside? What's, what's the whirlwind inside? Where can we join you? What if we shifted as from being so entrenched in what we think is this or this or this, and we actually went back to the foundation of Jesus, and before that, go back even to the foundation of God created us, and God created all of us, and he knows me by name, he knows you by name, he knows you by name, he knows the person who is, who is hurting and has made poor choices in their life, or not poor choices in life, who's trying to figure out how to add things up, not add things up, for all these different things for the person, and, and it, it, they're created and loved by God too. What if we take the time to shift and see our fellow humans walking with us and have, hold them in a higher level than what is printed on paper about why someone should be baptized a certain way or something else? What if we did that? And what if we were willing to take the weaker position? It takes strength, it takes internal strength to take the weaker position. But we take the weaker position of learner we take the weaker position of student. We take the weaker position of, of listening to the other person and letting the other person unload everything that's there. And then from there, we, by being their student, by learning this, then we're actually able then to, to at least make a connection, to share. We're sharing life already because they're sharing with us. But to share the hope that we have that actually sounds like hope, So can we, as churches, can we as the church believers in Christ, can we reach past our differences to join hands and to open our eyes, to work together, to see the lost, to love the lost, to share the hope of Jesus with the lost? Now, for those of us who are here who sit there and say, well, I have friends who that's how they handle something like the example of the abortion clinic. They gather around it, they protest it, they scream at people, they say, you know, and they're trying to save them. And I in all of this, and we sit there and say that that's not the approach we would take, but here's, rather than saying, well, you're wrong for screaming at them, because all that does is you set up your camp, let's apply an example, you set up your camp, you set up your camp, and then we're just, why? Ask them, why do you do this? Why? I want to, I just want to learn why, and see what they have to say, and learn from it. And maybe they'll start asking, why do we come at this? 
So, but let's, how, what do we do with this? We have it, what do we have in common? Jesus Christ, does our relationship with Jesus lead us to turn from sinful behavior? Can we reach the, past the differences to work together to see the lost, love the lost, and share the hope of Jesus with the lost? If it boils down to any answer on this on how to handle it, it's just to ask why and to listen. Don't ask why to set them up so that you can turn around and say, well, here's, yeah. Ask why and listen. Um, it works for people who have other religious beliefs, too, that are totally not Christian. Ask why. Why? And listen. And in all of this, if we take Paul's example and what he's writing here, and is to sit here, let us, let us use our energy and our time to introduce people to the truth that sets them free. And the truth that sets them free is Jesus Christ, the Son of the one and only true living God. It's so easy to get baited into the other stuff, isn't it? And then we put so much energy in it and time into it. And, and I don't know, some people even lose sleep over it and personal peace over it because this is here and that's there. And, but, and don't, when I say that, don't hear me discounting when discounting our, the folks who ask why or take the high road and then they folks keep drilling at them and trying to convince them why they need to be different in what they believe. But just why and then prayer about it. But ask why and let it, but try to, we need to try to remember to use our energy and our time to introduce people to the truth that sets them free. And that's Jesus Christ, the son of the one and only true living God. Jesus, the teachings of Jesus provide the foundation for freedom. Turning from sinful behavior and doing good, that's how you remain in freedom. And listening and then gently and respectfully sharing the source of our hope is what helps others who may disagree on what we have discover a new way of looking at things and find freedom. And it may help us as we disagree or how we're brought up to find freedom. Because how many things are there in our own journey that we have to sit there and go, well, why? Why? Why do we believe in what we believe when Jesus no, is, is, is the resurrection, pre-tribulation, post-tribulation? Why? Why do I believe this? Is there a thousand-year reign or not a thousand-year reign? Why? Why do I believe this? Should we sprinkle? Should we dunk? Should we pour? When we're baptizing, why should I believe it? As we ask why, let's just remember there's more people that are thirsty for what's inside of this than are interested in the argument about what it's, what's in it, how much is in it, how long it's been around, or any of that. Let's share the hope of Jesus by listening to one another and reaching past the other stuff. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your love for us. God, we thank you that you can help us to reach past all these different rules and regulations that we set up. So Jesus, help us in that. And Jesus, where we have been a distraction Lord, we confess it to you and ask for your forgiveness. And show us how to better share hope. Lord, help us to give an answer for the hope that we have with gentleness and respect. And help us to join together, hand in hand, as believers in Jesus Christ, as the one true way to be saved, and the Son of you, God, the one true living God, to join together in reaching the lost who are so diverse in background, so diverse in the way that you created them, that they all might hear and receive the salvation that comes through Jesus Christ, your Son. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So I invite you to worship with us with our closing song.
You'll remember this, maybe you will, he might, from last week. We did sing this, it's a special last week, and we wanted to kind of incorporate it into our repertoire. So as soon as Kurt fi figures out the beginning, <laughs> we'll be singing it. Night and 
in this place. Thank you for your words this morning. Thank you for the chance to just be together in worship. I pray that the words that were spoken and the truths that were told will help each of us as we, as we speak with others, as we talk with others, and we recognize that the important things that we should be doing have more to do with pointing others to you than, than the ways that we worship and the differences between us. I pray that in all of our in all of our work, in all of our words, in all of our time with, with others that we point to you in everything that we do. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You are worthy of it all. you guys have a blessed week